Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you again for inviting me to give a talk here at your 50th anniversary of UFRGS. It's a big honor and really appreciate that. Uh, I'm Anand J. Pupala. I'm a professor at Texas a and University. And my talk title is Performance Evaluation of Infrastructure Built on Problematic Expansive Soil. Okay, so let me start with the uh, the you know, presentation. Just to brief, before I go into it, I'd like to mention that you know uh, the center where I work right now is the picture you can see at the center. It's been established in the last years. It's known as Center for Infrastructure uh, for Renewal, CIR. My labs are placed over here. And before I joined Texas a and I was a Side of the, you know, task is in done. There are four topics, you know, uh, Professor Nilo Consoli asked me to talk on the infrastructure issues and the damages that they cause. I'm actually presenting uh, related. We have huge amounts of uh, uh, infrastructure here uh, and again, most of the huge moments that cause a sort of cracking. The first thing I will cover is expansive soils, infrastructure issues, and then characterization. We try to improve these characterization practices. You will see a little bit of the information there. Then I'll start with the pavement infrastructure. The first one is focused on shallow soil stabilization method. And again, uh, we have made some advances in this method. We were trying to improve this uh, you know, design of this stabilization. And then I also will briefly touch the deep soil mixing, which is also used in some areas for supporting pavement infrastructure. And then I will uh, also you know, touch base on the slopes and embankments, which are most of the time, unfortunately, in this region are made of the expansive soil fields. So that causes a lot of uh, slope failures. And then I'll give you some concluding remarks. So the civil infrastructure, we are play a very important role, the, particularly if you look at the transportation side or this, and also pipelines. Almost all the civil infrastructure, you know, touches uh, the you know the nation's economy is it relies on these things. So a very sound and robust infrastructure will play a, a major role in your GDP growth. You know, uh, infrastructure really provides access to you know, everything. So civil infrastructure is the most important. Unfortunately, you know, this infrastructure is pretty old and it's also if you have a problematic challenge in you do not properly maintain them or if you do not have sufficient maintenance dollars, these things will start crumbling. You can see this is our ranking, you know, report card, you know, we have most of them received C's and D's and that's because, you know, the infrastructure is pretty old. We're trying to correct this thing and it's actually start. So one area where this problem is a very big is because this is the expansive soils. The definition for expansive soil is the soils fell and shrink with respect to changes in weather. So if you have summer to you know winter or with a lot of rain, you have huge amounts of weather changes that causes the soils to swell or shrink. As a result, anything that you built on the top of the structures will ex experience this damage. And this damage can be manifested into some kind of cracking and sometimes huge damage, huge failures. You will see that kind of uh, pictures later on. So the repairs to you know, the infrastructure damage is caused by expensive soils are reported to be around 8 billion per, per year. And it's again, that includes a lot of them, not just uh, one or two topics. It includes pavements, dams, embankments, residential homes, and everything. So it's a huge issue. But clearly states like Texas, we have, we have expansive soils are everywhere. We have a huge problem. Typical expansive soils, you know, any soil that has montemolonite, a rich montemolonite clay minerals, you will know that as a very expansive. We also have some over consolidated clays and then soils composed with shale materials, these materials tend to, you know, show swell behavior. So we have lots of these types of soils, you know. So 
So just to show you the Klemenrazi side, Montemont light on the right hand side, the picture shows you the SEM image and also the structure of the Montemont light. You can see that, you know, the two to one, and then you see the H2O water molecule as you know, we're right in the middle of these two lattices. So what you have is a high amount of water in the lattices will start swelling this uh, clay mineral. As a result, you have, uh, you will see the swelling happening at the surface level to the infrastructure. So the important thing is the clay mineral, you know, the current practice to know whether it's expansive soil or not is simple plasticity index, which is difference between liquid limit and plastic limit. Unfortunately, this is always uh, not going to give you a good solution. So we wanted to, you know, change that practice. And uh, the less focus on clay minerals, which is requires you to learn a little bit of soil chemistry, particularly if you are dealing with the specific surface area or cation exchange capacity, CEC. You need to know them because the soils such as Montemolnet has high specific surface area and also high CEC. So if you can recognize them, then you know you are de really dealing with an expansive soil. So we were hoping soil chemistry based clay mineralogy identification is a good way to know what type of soil you're dealing with than just relying on the plasticity index. So here are some pictures of the damage here, you know, a few of them. Uh, have lots of them. So you can see the roads that are like roller coaster rides. So that's very typical. So a lot of times uh, folks ask me, how do we know which side, uh, wh where the soils are bad? If you drive around, you will know what you're dealing with. In some areas in Dallas Fort Worth area, I um, mean, you know, you will know that the soils are very bad just by driving. You will see the car in the, when you drive it, you are having roller coaster type of, uh, you know, Hitting. Hopefully, you don't hit your roof, but you will do some cases. So that tells you the soils are pretty bad. The other parts are like you know you can see the right hand side the retaining walls. Even the right behind the wall you have a good backfill, but behind that is the native soil which is expansive soil. So in some cases when you it, it rains then the soil starts swelling. Easiest place it will go is towards the retaining wall side MSC wall, and that causes a lot of movements. We have seen. The walls started sliding, and also we see sometimes the, the segmented blocks coming off from the from the wall. And you see the other things like you know the one of them is the Jopul Lake. The road is pretty you know a few months old. You see the how it stripped off all because of the soil swelling caused by underlying soils. Sometimes at the bridges you can see this uh, on the right hand side the support system when the weight uh, goes up and down that pretty much tells you that the soils there are pretty. These are some of the pictures of our, uh, uh, you know, systems. we do use a very stiff, uh, you know, rigid pavement, but some of these uh, soils, uh, so much swelling, even causes cracking, even in the concrete uh, pavements, you know, some of them are mild uh, or moderately reinforced concrete pavement. So this is a very common problem in Texas, uh, you know, so the soils are high, you know, more to more night rich material, so it will experience a lot of swelling, you know. So this is a very uh, common uh, issue. We also have issues on the dams and the highway embankments where look, you know, the soils there can swell and shrink. Then when shrink, there's a lot of cracking, you can see. And then the first rainfall that you have in that area will cause a lot of water to go down. And as the water goes down, it starts saturating the embankment mass, the whole mass that is stable before because of this uh, you know, cracking and then saturation, more area gets saturated. So the whole thing cannot stay in the position at which uh, it's compacted. So it starts coming down. We see massive failures, like we call them as skin slides or, you know, or superficial slope failures on the dams here. And then you can see sometimes the roads built on the crest completely gave away because of the failure of the side slopes. So this is a common occurrence in our region. And, you know, and you can here one side that the wall is actually started sliding down you know the soil started cracking and the rain went there and then that and this kind of infrastructure distress are typically attributed to the underlying in Paris district. 
road is few months old, I believe six months old. So within six months, the cracking is so high, the soils are very expansive here. Uh, the cracks were found out with uh, the crack widths are anywhere around uh, you know, uh, three to four or five centimeters. You can see my PhD student pushing there at that time. And the depth of the crack was almost like, you know, uh, almost 60 centimeters. Amount of cracking that happened, it could be attributed to again expansive soil. And a lot of times this, the cracking comes from the side of the unpaved shoulders and then starts propagating into the travel paved lanes. So it's a, it's a different uh, things and that causes it. Sometimes even the, if you have a huge vegetation also that takes the moisture away from the subgrade can cause shrinkage cracking. So we have all kinds of uh, expansive soil related issues on our uh, roads over there. So one of the interesting scenario came is how do we come up with a better then also use that the characterization towards soil stabilization for expensive soils. So you saw the few previous pictures, we showed you a lot of failures, you know, most of them are in the shrinkage cracking side. And we also like look at it most of the times we use plasticity index or PI property to understand One of the things uh, we noticed is the two soils with the same PI are not necessarily the same type of soil. And that's very obvious. I can show you two liquid limit plastic limits. They give you same PI number because the PI is the difference between liquid limit and plastic limit. But when you have different liquid limit, different plastic limits, but you, know, you may have similar PI, but it's in totally different soils. And we have seen that in our, uh, in our locations here. And there's one soil, when you have high liquid limit, but then high PI, that's expansive, that really works well. But other soil that has a low liquid limit, but high, same PI, it's not necessarily same expansive. So we, because of this, we have a lot of, you know, discrepancy on how we, in, you know, the design stabilization methods work, because most design stabilizations use the PI number. So in some areas, the PI is no problem. The design gives you good solution. That's most likely because the soils there have low expansive minerals. Whereas the next to another district, you have soils with a similar PI, but then suddenly, even if you stabilize the same way, it, they don't work very well. It's all because the clay mineralogies are different in each soil. It's uh, something we studied. And then again, also the stabilization needs to check with the durability assessments because mont to -mont and how its interactions with the stabilization will be a function of how good and durable is your stabilization. So that's something I will touch base here in this uh, thing. So this particular table shows you some of our soils here. So if you look at on the top, there are two soils, Bran and Fort Worth. You know, Bran has a dominant uh, PI. The both soils have similar PI around 30. But if you look at the liquid limit, Soils with high bond to it has a high. Soils with low liquid limit has a low, you know, calonite type of mineral. So calonite is considered as non-expensive clay mineral. Elite is a moderate expensive clay mineral, and then bond to We most of the time we use these three minerals in understanding the soil behavior. Even though we do have other minerals, these are the three most important basic clay minerals. So. Everything I'm presenting is in top in terms of this uh, dominant clay minerals. So it will explain you a soil that is Fort Worth, uh, you know, is having issues because it has really, you know, high amount of moonlight. Whereas soil like, mostly of brand doesn't have an issue because it's really calonite, even though they may both have the same PI. So the folks that have brand, they may have no issues with the stabilization, whereas the folks from Fort Worth will have huge issues. So it basically understanding the clay chemistry or clay mineralogy would have helped in understanding what is happening. You know, that's something we brought into this thing. Just to show you another two soils, Paris and Far B, similar PIs, but then if you look at the mineralogy wise, they're different. So one of my PhD student, Dr. Chituri is a professor in, uh, you know, in uh, Boise State University. He did work on this clay mineralogy identification using several natural and artificial clay samples. So this paper is an ASC journal. You may be interested, please uh, look at this paper. 
other thing I would like to mention here is, you know, as I said, you know, uh, so I'll say clearly said, you know, that with the claim and Raji, we now know that we can improve our expenses by factorization practice. So that was one of our aim all along in the last uh, 30 plus years. Uh, my goal is to really improve the soil characterization. Try to go beyond plasticity index, uh, you know, uh, you know, PM more fundamental soil science into it. And then also use this claim analogy into the design of you know, stabilizers for the soils. So that, that's the number two. So the, the first one here is uh, one of our projects from National Science Foundation. We actually looked at how can we improve the expansive soil characterization. So as a part of this project, we looked at several factors that contribute to soil heaving. And the compositional side, you have the clay mineralogy, pore size distribution. And then on the environmental side, the compaction conditions, moisture content, burning pressure, all these things will control your soil behavior. And then we have unsaturated soil you know, framework is important in this case because most of the expansive soils are in unsaturated state. So incorporating the, the water, soil water characteristic curve, which is, you know, gives you a relationship between soil suction and the moisture regime, that will also help a lot with your understanding of expansive soil behavior. So as a part of the NSA project, we try to look at the soil chemistry, particularly on the clays. So there's three types of uh, all the three dominant clay minerals, calonite, elite, montmorillonite were focused on it. And we try to characterize them and using soil chem chemical analysis, including CEC and also specific surface area. We came up with the methodology to identify uh, these three approximate amounts in our clay, how much we have. So you can see calonite is, you know, is a, a coarser material compared to montmorillonite, montmorillonite finer, but montmorillonite have a very high specific surface area. So they actually absorb more water, which causes more, you know, water induced swelling in the soil. So the other thing we did is once we you know, do the soil composition properties, including clay mineral, we link them with swell properties. We try different types of soil, soil properties. Now, in the case of micro scale, uh, we also looked at the We also include soil water On the macro scale measurements, we were measuring swell properties. This includes uh, 1D swell strain, 2D swell strain, I mean, 3D swell strain, and also swell pressures. So we try to correlate them. Then another thing we did is that once we, you know, using all the experimental data, we went and developed some models and that models were more advanced than what simple, simplistic the PI based models to enhance our understanding of swelling in the soil. So here is one model I'm just presenting. There are three types of models uh, presented. So this paper was published in engineering geology. Uh, and basically, you know, here what we included is if you look at it on the x-axis, there's a mechanical hydrochemical parameter. So it includes your geology information as well as soil water uh, curve information into this MHCP. And that we compared that with our soil prediction. So there's a decent correlation, you know, Obviously, around 0.7 or above is what we received. So, decent correlation. So, so, this only important thing you have to emphasize is you need more data or more uh, lab work to include it. But then, the more you have, you have better way of understanding how expansive nature your soil is. So, this is one of them. There are two other models developed. So, you can find that information in the journals we publish in Engineering Mechanics and also Journal of Geotech. Engineering Geotechnical, JGGE. Journal also has one paper. So I'll be happy to share it. If you all are interested in these topics, please email me. I'll be happy to share these papers. The next thing we did is we now learn how to identify clay minerals, which are instrumental in understanding the so we took that information and then we developed the stabilization designs. We included clay minerology. We also looked at durability, which will tell you how the stabilization uh, works well in the field, you know, so we consider durability testing. So these are eight soils. Each soil we identified what is their dominant uh, minerals, you know, you can see here. 
there are four soils that are red color that has high mon to mon rate amount. So that will pretty much tell you, you know, the, like we also have soils that are, you know, mon to mon light dominant and calonite dominant and light. So these eight soils were predominantly used. And we, you know, showed you this before. And again, it helped us in understanding how, you know, when we design the stabilization based on current practice. So one of the things is, you know, to understand it's working well or not is durability. Durability study here is really focused on the ASTM D596 method using both wetting and drying cycles. So in each case, we actually change the calculated the volume and the loss of material, you know, all those things we've measured as a part of the standard. As we also did the unconfined compression strength at every, different cycles. So each cycle is considered as that means around roughly around 48 hours is constitutes to one cycle. So again, this is the full wetting and you can see oven based drying that is on the right hand side. Uh, testing was done like, you know, we, we put established like 21 cycles for the whole thing. So almost like 42 days. So each time after civilization. So then in, in between that at, at different cycles, set cycles, we took some, we prepared samples and then started doing this durability. But after every few cycles, we took the sample out they're more close to similar compaction conditions. So that gave us, you know, how much strength is retained after so many cycles, you know. So the basically the, our goal is to see whether we are accomplishing stabilization durability in all 21 cycles we are doing it or not. So this particular figure shows you the, the, the uh, you know, and uh, Fort Worth soil, uh, both untreated on the top, the untreated top, you can see within a day, within like you know, a second, the sample failed. The one stabilized cycle, the soil, which is in the second row of the figures. At the start, it looks intact. After three cycles, it's not that bad. Then seven cycles, you started seeing some cracking that started growing up. And then after 10 cycles, the sample, you know, within a cycle, it started failing. So this is because this soil has a high amount of mount monolite, so it did not undergo the full durability 21 plus cycles. So just to show you the same thing in the figure wise, you know, I'm just showing you soil. The Keller soil has high calonite and this, so this is being a calonite dominant. If you look at it here, 6% lime is used for stabilization as per the guidance. So after 21 cycles, there is still like a little bit of volume change, but it's still, you know, on both 12 sessions said there's small amount less than maybe if you add up both of them. But did not experience any failure. It still was intact. If you look at the strength side, the strength also pretty uniform, did not have any drastic decrease. Again, this is untreated within a cycle, it failed. So overall this soil, cal, you know, cal calor soil has a calonite. So it did uh, undergo full 21 cycles without any issue. So that explains that calonite is okay. But when we looked at, uh, and I'm showing you one example of soil with the mount monolite. Just for this study, we compared also cement. Look at it, uh, the triangle symbols are for 6% lime, and then the X mark is for 6% cement. So the cement actually went through all 21 cycles, you know, Whereas the lime actually failed after um, after certain cycles around like you know 13 cycle it failed, and on the left side if you see the UCS uh, the lime very quickly failed you know it did not even reach. Whereas the other one the cement treated actually because of high unconfined compression strength it did undergo drastic decrease with the cycles, but it still survived after 21 cycles. But the rate of loss of you know the whole this uh, UCS tells me that Montmorillon -Mont does have a Huge impact. So, in in the end, like when we compare it, we came up with some clear guidance. The soils that are rich in Montmorillon that we did not variability throughout the whole time, whereas soils that have different. This explains to you the Montmorillon Mont and is an important role in the durability performance. This is something if you include it or increase your stabilization, if you have a Montmorillon light, you may get a better performance for your supporting your role. Here are some publications. 
you know, welcome to check them out. And also please feel free to contact me if you need them more. So moving on, the next topic is expansive soils with the deep mixing. We have areas where the soils are much deeper in depth. In some locations, almost like, you know, four or five meters of expansive soil. So in that case, eventually we have all the kinds of uh, roughness happening. Um, then, because you can see here at this picture, the expanses are causing this issue. So we do have volumetric stability, which is considered as the roughness for a road. So in a road has a huge amount of expanses soil, you will have this information. The traditional design on this kind of situation is remove the expansive, but removing almost like a, a four to four and a half meters is pretty. So we thought we should look for another method, which is using deep soil mixing, DM method. That's so one of our project is, you know, our goal is to cut down the soil shrink and then, you know, develop the, a more uniform support for roads. So deep soil mixing, you know, our DM is simply basically, you know, you use auger and as you make the augering through the soil, you inject your chemicals. So you create different types of configurations like columns, walls, and all kinds of things. So in our case, we did the single auger. So you have a column. So one of the things we did is the project is an earth. So we have almost 12 feet of expansive soil, high roughness in those areas. You know, the pavement has high roughness and a lot of main. So we choose our test sites right between the medians of two locations, 820, both you know, uh, you know, east side and west side, right in the middle. That's where one site here, the other site is over here. So we did a lot of work here, and then we have come up with a design when we designed it, we tried to under design it so that the whole section will fail. So we try to do it like in you know, a 10 to 12 feet of the treatment, then we used a heaving, and then we try to calculate the area for treatment versus untreated zones. And then we also did the work and everything. And just show you here, we used our you know, Fred Lennon and the hard job formulation on expansive swelling. And we used the both again, using soil suction and also the loading pressures. And then again, this CS is your composite uh, swell index. So using the treated area, you have a area of treatment. Untreated area is this equation. So you get a composite property. And again, that is something uh, uh, will help us in understanding uh, the, the design. So basically once we did it, uh, we went back and, uh, you know, a ratio. So the area ratio is defined as area of treated soil divided by total area. So we try to do area ratio of 30%, which is the one third area. So we did that and then we came up with the, some columns of the design. The one important thing we did is we put a, a geograde, typical deep mixing for a soft soil, they use a, a, a geograde by arching that will support the transfer of the loads. But in this case, it's a reverse of arch in between the columns will swell. So we use the anchor system. So we used an anchor rods of like, you know, approximately around 50 feet anchor rods are placed to kind of fasten the geogrid with each of the treated soil. So we have designed everything. Here are some pictures of the geogrid at the place. You see the anchor rods, the top, the top plate, and this is where the geogrid, and you have all the instrumentation, including kilometers as well as pressure cells. So again, this is students working the whole project side there. You can see on both sides of the road, there's a live traffic. So one thing, you know, once we finished this thing, we studied, we sweated the whole area. Our sites actually, DM treated soils did not, there's this very small moment. The treatment was very effective. So we developed some design guidance and you know, we clearly showed that, you know, also with the non-destructive testing, the stabilization can be doable at a high. So one, Important thing is because it's an expensive soil, and then these are because uh, they are really, uh, you know, a little bit of a medium stiff material. You have to do pilot holes first before you can do any of the uh, deep mixing. So you really need to do pilot drilling holes and then do the deep mixing. Otherwise, deep mixing like you do on soft soils won't work there. So our deep mixing was very proven to be very effective in this case, and we have several papers, it's including one in JGG. So please look into those papers. 
So the last topic I'll be covering is dams and embankments. Our next we have huge numbers of sufficient slope failures, as you can see here, massive failures of the embankments and also highways. You will see also a lot of highways, in this case, a levy. Both sides, you see a lot of scarfs or failures. So again, this is all what we call it is a shrinkage, cracking, and then rainfall causes the, the tremendous failure. So we have this uh, is a they push the soil back and compact it, but then within two years, again, that thing will come down. So one of the things is US Army Corps of Engineers was asking me to work with the different treatment methods as a cutting down the cracking area. So we looked at compost, uh, which is a biosolids material. We also looked at lime and fibers. Several sections were done at both camps. And then we can we filled out and like prepared our test sections. And this is done. For three plus years. And this is how the soil treated section is gonna look like. It's around that area, 7.6 by eight years. Then we instrumented it and then we monitored almost three plus years. Based on this, our slope sections that were like treated with lime and fiber, they worked very well. Compost did not perform that well. And again, there are failures actually interesting to note the failures on the left side of our test sections and the other side of it, but we did not have failure. So my opinion, actually our treatment actually helped in this making that section stable. So and we actually recommended the best ones are the, like recommended here, lime and fiber. So these are our best performing. So we have developed these guidance, several other entities are using these technologies now to stabilize the slopes. So you stabilize a part of the slope, not, you know, it could be anywhere from 18 inches to 24 inches thick treatment. And then on the 10, you put your topsoil for vegetation and that will cut down your cracking going into the uh, slope. Let me uh, end with some closing remarks again. I think, you know, one thing I haven't mentioned is civil infrastructure building on expansive soils is always challenging because there's so many fields that we need to include. And I want to emphasize fell and shrinkage testing is very important. We don't do that much on shrinkage, but shrinkage is what starts with the problem. And then us to study shrinkage, don't just go directly with the uh, swelling alone. So I think that is something we have. You definitely think that you can improve your characterization by including more testing. You know, don't go with the simple testing. If you do that, you will have to pay for it, the repairs, you know. So one of my mantras to tell them, you know, the what you pay is what you get. If you don't spend too much and then initially do a shortcut, then later you will pay by maintenance dollars. Again, we have a lot of new materials. We are also looking at new construction methods. Again, I'll show you one of them is deep mixing but there are a lot of other stabilizing materials, uh, Professor Consoli, that group. Our ultimate goal is really come up with sustainable, resilient infrastructure. So less maintenance, you know, your dog. All this work is done by my grad students here, most of the students are not graduates, so I owe it to them. Uh, so there are a lot of students, who, you know, from many places. They're all my research group. I'm very thankful to every one of them. And I also want to mention several, uh, acknowledge a lot of my agencies that funded me. And I also want to clearly mention, I'm very thankful to my, uh, you know, NSF uh, funding projects, plus Tech Start and Water District and Army Corps, and also Tenkate Geosynthetics. We are doing some interesting work for Tenkate now. We also have University Transportation Center, and there are two of them been fortunate to do the work. So all these agencies, I want to acknowledge them for their assistance and their help with the research funding. Again, the last question thing I want to mention is my good friend, Professor Nilo Consoli. When Nilo asked me to present it, I had to agree. He's a good friend. And again, I will hope to visit him uh, you know, in person in the next couple of years or hopefully next year. You know, I also think, you know, UFRGS, you know, a lot of friends here and a very good group and great group, great research coming from you. And uh, you are also very like, you know, uh, super research on your sustainable binders, chemical stabilizations, a lot of great work from many of you. Again, I want to thank them. Again, I also want to wish one more time 50th, happy 50th uh, 
should I say happy 50th birthday, or, you know, or the anniversary, whatever, please, again, you will have next 100 years or maybe more, much longer, beautiful years ahead of you. It's a great place. And I can't wait to come forward again in the next uh, coming year or two, okay? Again, congratulations. And also, again, uh, I hope I gave you a little bit of overview with everything. And again, all the best for the conference. And thank you again for giving me this opportunity to present this to you. Thank you.